Welcome to India Special. I am Ajaz Heather. U.S. President Donald Trump will be visiting India next week. His two-day visit was being billed as a big one. But will it more than Trump glad-handing India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi? For his part, Trump has already poured water on any high hopes by saying that the U.S. has not been treated well by India. Trump also said that he's saving the big deal with India for later, and he does not know if it will be done before the November presidential election. Observers in both the U.S. and India say this indicates that a major bilateral trade deal during his visit to Delhi might not be on the cards. What are the expectations in India? To discuss that, we are joined by Swasini from Delhi. Swasini is the national editor and diplomatic affairs editor at The Hindu. Thank you, Swasini. For three years, tensions have been escalating on the issue of trade balance, which, as you know, is a Trump obsession. And that's not just in relation to India. He has done that with much closer allies. When he slapped higher tariffs on Indian goods, India hit back, and he retaliated by removing India from the preferential trade program, and then from the program that shields countries from trade reprisals. Is that going to impact this visit? Well, let's put it this way. You're quite right. Trade has been at the top of the mind when it comes to President Trump and all his bilateral relationships seem to have been colored by how good or bad the trade relationship is. So it is definitely a concern that the two sides have not yet been able to agree on a trade deal, even a small trade deal, which is what Mr. Robert Lighthizer, the U.S. trade representative, and the Indian Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal have been trying to work out. Um, but I want to put a rider in there. When you heard President Trump say over there that we're not able to get this trade deal done right now, it may happen after the election. There may be a bigger uh, uh, deal after the elections. Uh, we can't be completely sure that what he was essentially saying is that there's a lid on the trade deal for now or whether the U.S. is simply leveraging uh, for just a little more negotiating power ahead of the visit itself. Because remember... Uh, according to Indian officials, they are still expecting the U.S. trade representative, Robert Lighthizer, to come to India as a part of Mr. Trump's uh, entourage. Um, so the question is, will that, uh, will that deal, a small deal of some sort, be announced anyway? Uh, I think that's still open. This leveraging thing, and I agree with you, but, you know, here's the thing. This is a bad time for India to get into a trade spat with the U.S., there's an economic crunch. Unemployment is near a half century high. The IMF has slashed India's growth forecast to, I think, 4.8% this year. Modi's approach has been to go back to the protection playbook. Is that going to fly? I mean, in the sense that if the U.S. is actually looking for leverage, then is this how India should play it? Look, you can't put a gloss on the fact that there are trade tensions. The fact that the two sides slapped tariffs on each other all of last year. The fact that the U.S. has withdrawn India's GSP uh, status. Um, uh, and the fact that India has, um, has come out with new uh, laws of different kinds that the U.S. has had a problem with when it comes to trade uh, means that there is a gap between their understanding of each other. Uh, can India afford it at this time? Uh, perhaps not, but can the U.S. really afford a, a trade war with, uh, with India when, you know, in terms of the optics, given that the U.S. is also strong-arming China, given that the U.S. is also in all kinds of trade uh, uh, negotiations with other countries as well? Uh, I, th I think at the end of the day, you have to remember that bilateral trade in goods and services between the two countries is still $160 billion. Uh, the, uh, there's no question that the Indian side would like to wrap up some kind of a deal. But as you pointed out yourself, Prime Minister Modi has taken a more protectionist stand in the last uh, few months, particularly, uh, quite the contrary to what most people had expected in his second term. And maybe the, maybe the cost-benefit analysis that the government is working out says that he needs his, polit uh, his political gains much more than he needs bilateral trade gains for the moment. Now, here's the paradox and also perhaps uh, the irony that Trump is an inward-looking nationalist leader. Uh, so is Narendra Modi. Now, that actually creates some kind of, you know, uh, a bonding, personal bonding between them. But that also means that they could be pulling uh, in, in different directions when it comes to how uh, the negotiations need to happen. I mean, India, uh, as the Americans have been saying, that they need a uh, win uh, with India. Uh, whereas Modi, as I said, 
is looking inwards. Uh, you know, they, uh, India is also talking about, in a sense, almost autarky. Uh, uh, you know, so that's a, that's an area where it seems to me that uh, perhaps a big trade deal might not happen. But that's my personal sense. I don't know how you're looking at that. Do you know, um, Ajazan, you've covered so many of these visits where you realize that uh, so much is about also the announcement that needs to be made. Sometimes it doesn't get backed up by anything at all. You know, when President Obama came to India in 2015, he and Prime Minister Modi's big ticket item, the big deal that was announced was that the nuclear deal, all the, all the problems with the nuclear deal had been resolved. The nuclear deal was finally done between India and the U.S., and yet, five years later, we still have not seen one commercial agreement when it comes to nuclear energy between India and the U.S. for a, a, a bunch of various reasons. But clearly, whatever was announced then has not necessarily been backed up. So one part of it is how these two leaders will want to show that they are able to work together. Because it is in everyone's interest when you have a high-level visit like this one, Mr. Trump and Mr. Modi standing together in front of a massive crowd, uh, Mr. Modi and Mr. Trump walking together at Hyderabad House, they are going to want to have something substantial to announce. Uh, and the trade deal has been one of their outstanding uh, issues. Um, on the other hand, as you pointed out, these are two strong men. These are two alpha men, if you like. Uh, they each have make America great again and make in India as, a, as, a, as their uh, slogan, if you like. Um, so there is necessarily going to be areas of clash between the two when it comes to trade and protectionism issues. Um, I, I think what's what's important to remember is Mr. Modi has actually come through an election. Mr. Trump is heading into an election. Correct. Uh, and it is possible that uh, they will look for some kind of a face saver announcement for the moment uh, and then perhaps pick up the trade deal, as Mr. Trump said, next year. Because the larger trade deal, which is supposed to envisage a, a more bilateral, even a free trade agreement uh, between the two countries, is certainly a way away. Final question, Sunny. Uh, many U.S. observers, especially people who were part of, uh, you know, the Bush administration, also the uh, the Obama administration, they're saying, uh, and they're obviously uh, criticizing and critiquing how the Trump administration is looking at this whole trade uh, imbalance thing. I mean, the deficit is just what, like twenty-five billion dollars or so. But they're saying that there's a there's a broader picture here which is about the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, which obviously, as you know, relates to uh, the emergence of China. Uh, so is, uh, are the Indians also looking at it like this in, in terms of, you know, uh, or are they saying that, well, it's OK, it's, it's, it's better if the U.S. does not really pull us into that kind of uh, anti-China camp? Look, I think uh, for, the, for the moment, trade seems to be divorced, if you like, from uh, India and the U.S.'s strategic platform and the strategic relationships between the two countries. Uh, I certainly expect that during this visit, the larger uh, announcements will come from India's regional context. Uh, one part of it will be, as you pointed out, the Indo-Pacific strategy, which includes India, the U.S., Japan, uh, and Australia, as far as the U.S. is concerned. Uh, India has other partners as well in it. So the Indo-Pacific strategy, which is which is uh, broadly seen as a counter to China in the maritime space, and the other regional context is going to be what is going to happen in Afghanistan. India is watching that closely. Uh, the fact that there is an announcement imminent between the U.S. and Taliban, maybe even while Mr. Trump is in India, yeah. uh, is going to be watched closely. What is the role that the U.S. is going to see for Pakistan in that? That is going to be watched closely. So I think the regional context is going to be important when it comes to strategic ties between the two countries. I am not sure it's going to link up with the trade relationship at all, particularly given how difficult the trade relationship has become. You know, um, okay. when Prime Minister Modi had gone to the U.S. in September last year, he and Mr. Trump had uh, done a similar sort of joint rally together in Houston. And everyone had ex expected really that uh, the two sides yeah, would be was, able to at that least... Was, in yeah, there's, there's an optics also involved in this. Uh, thank you, uh, Sohasni Heather, for speaking with us. We are now joined by Dr. Moeed Yusuf, Special Assistant of the Prime Minister of National Security Division and Chairman Strategic Policy Planning Cell. Welcome to the program, Moeed. Let's begin with the basics. How does Pakistan look at Trump's India visit next week? Are we worried in any way? 
Um, thank you, Jaz. Uh, look, I, I, I don't think there is any need to worry um, uh, for Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan has not taken a zero-sum approach to the U.S.-India relationship uh, for years. Uh, we've never made the argument in recent times uh, that if the U.S. and India have a relationship uh, and partnership, then uh, the U.S. and Pakistan must be on opposite sides. You know, our argument throughout now, and this is the vision for our international relations anywhere, that we are going to become partners in peace to any country that's willing to work with us in that way. And despite the fact that China-U.S. competition is rising by the day, um, that we and China, our strategic partners, have been and will remain, our signaling still remains very openly that we want a good relationship with the U.S., so as long as U.S. and India and their partnership, they're looking to do what they are doing, and it does not affect Pakistan negatively. If there's no direction of that relationship that's targeting uh, Pakistan, uh, you know, I don't think that we are at all worried. We are a sovereign nation. We are a strong nation. We are looking to build our own relationships. Um, you know, if President Trump is going there and, and meeting his uh, counterpart in India, well, that's their relationship. But we, have, but know, we have raised concern over the $2.5 billion prospective deal of attack helicopters that India is quite interested in point I'm making. The, the first part of what I'm explaining to you is that this critique that, oh, Pakistan thinks in zero-sum terms, it's absolutely incorrect. Uh, but when it comes to parts of the relationship, like any other relationship, that we clearly see are going to undermine our interests, of course, we're going to raise concerns. So these attack helicopters, uh, who are they going to be attacking? You know, for years we have heard this uh, from across our eastern border. Oh, actually, we are focused on China. We don't, uh, you know, worry about Pakistan. And virtually every uh, military acquisition, virtually all the military formations still remain Pakistan-centric and Pakistan-specific. Of course, if you're going to buy something that can be used against China and Pakistan, they're going to say China. But there's so much in the Indian military, um, uh, uh, their platforms and their formations, that are very much focused on us. You're hearing statements saying, oh, we can take down Pakistan in 11 days and all that nonsense. In that kind of um, you know, fascist environment, how can we not raise concerns about this? Of course we will. But our mindset is not zero-sum at all. Absolutely. That's a fair point. Now, here's the thing. Trump said to reporters that India hasn't treated the U.S. well. At the same time, he said he likes Modi. What exactly is his thrust? I mean, surely these are two nationalist leaders and perhaps there's a lot of, uh, you know, glad handing. But is there something more to that? If you were to ask for an honest opinion, I think there is so much um, sort of um, change in the perspective of the U.S. president from time to time. But I, I, you know, it's, it's difficult to always analyze on a long-term basis. I think what this means is that his, uh, the U.S. president's view across the globe of, of um, trade is a very relativist, old-school view that if I am gaining less than my other counterparts, part, uh, there must be something wrong with it. I must be gaining more. Now, that's not liberal economics, but, but uh, classic relativist uh, economics does say that. So in that sense, India is a very difficult customer to deal with, of course. Um, you know, I remember when I was in Washington uh, working there, uh, there, there used to be this uh, concern all the time from U.S. officials that Pakistan is actually a, a very easy country to work with, rational operators uh, versus India, where there's a lot of red tape and a lot of uh, sort of perhaps ego attached to it. So I think that's probably what it's pointing to. Uh, he's pointing to. But again, if he's traveling there, he has a trip, then surely that relationship is for everybody to see. So um, at the end of the day, I'm not sure I'm not going to be the one who's decoding it. My point is very simple. Any creating a relationship with anybody else, as long as it doesn't affect me, I don't have a problem with. As soon as it will affect me, if I can see, I can get a sense that something is going to affect me negatively, I have absolute right as a sovereign country to raise concern, and that's how we're operating on this one too. Okay, so I had Suhasni Heather before you joined me, and she also talked about the fact that you know India is closely watching uh, the U.S. Taliban deal. Uh, and India is also obviously watching what Pakistan's role in Afghanistan will be. Now, do you think that 
post any kind of deal, there can be any kind of role for India in Afghanistan. And if there is, what kind of role are we okay with and what is it that we are concerned about? Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, there are certainly some countries in the region who do not want um, stability and quick peace in Afghanistan, who actually benefit from the current arrangement where um, the U.S. presence is there, will remain there, will give cover to, to activities um, uh, you know, of, of, of other countries, their presence. Um, and so if there is a power-sharing arrangement in which Afghanistan um, has a new um, government uh, after an intra-Afghan dialogue in which the Taliban are also present, um, not all countries uh, are, are liking that, and some are actively undermining that. Let me be clear about that as well. That said, in terms of what role who has is a sovereign Afghan decision, uh, we have constantly said we want a stable and peaceful Afghanistan. Bottom line, and full stop. Uh, we even have dropped the word friendly, which was quite frankly said um, as a brotherly country, but was misinterpreted in the past. So it's really stability in Afghanistan. Again, as long as anything from Afghanistan does not affect us negatively. If we have evidence that Afghan soil is being used against Pakistan's interests, we will definitely raise concern. We, will, we definitely have the right uh, to continue raising this and uh, protecting ourselves against it. But whatever is an Afghan sovereign decision is an Afghan sovereign decision. Thank you. That was Dr. Moeed Yusuf, Special Assistant to the Prime Minister for National Security Division and Chairman uh, Strategic Policy Planning Cell. Uh, we are now joined by Christian Connett, who is Chair of Policing and Security and Director of the International Center for Policing and Security at the University of South Wales. Uh, Dr. Connett, thank you for being on the program. We were discussing uh, President Trump's upcoming uh, visit to India. Uh, and there are concerns, obviously, from the Indian side um, and also from the U.S. side in relation to the trade problems that have been going on for a while. It's almost been three years now and attentions have been increasing. Um, how do you look at the situation as far as the trade relations are concerned between the U.S. and India? Of course, it's a, it's a very important topic. And in fact, trade has been one of the issues that really defined uh, President Trump's presidency. Him, like other pre unlike other presidents, American presidents, has been seen as far more protectionist, wants to put America first and wants to, to really push through policies that are more beneficial for the United States than, than even sometimes for allies. So in, in those terms, of course, it is a very, very complicated topic for, for the Indian side. And Trump is not a very easy interlocutor. He's certainly made it very clear how he wants to put American interests first. And I think that is something that will be a vital kind of part of their negotiation strategy, where they will have to find a way to to please the American side in terms of recognizing American interests while also pursuing their own interests, which, of course, is very important. Now, this is interesting. I mean, you're absolutely right about uh, Trump's uh, protectionist policies. But India also, under Narendra Modi, has gone to that uh, playbook. As a matter of fact, last year, they bailed out of the huge regional comprehensive economic partnership. This is a trade bloc that groups all of Asia's big economies, uh, and including China. And they're talking about making India and, you know, almost sounding like, you know, uh, achieving autarky uh, rather than being an export-based uh, economy. Uh, so uh, you, we, we are really looking at the meeting of two leaders uh, that seem to be cut from the same cloth in many ways. Exactly. I think that is something that uh, the new age is, in a sense, symbolizing. I think there's more and more leaders that are seeing to an extent, uh, the limits of globalization and, uh, and are pursuing a more protectionist policy where they seem to think there's more economic benefit to be derived from protecting domestic industry. And of course, in that way, 
India has a very, very big advantage in that sense because it has already a relatively big market. And in, in, in such a way, um, this is a policy that appears when you have more and more powers, such as the United States and, of course, uh, China and, and others that are protective of their market. It, it, at first sight, it appears a policy that could be beneficial. But, of course, as we've seen over the last decades, uh, there's a big downside to that because if all the powers collectively decided to go down that route, of course, we would see a serious um, uh, serious reduction in global trade. And as a result of that, in a sense, everybody would to an extent lose. But um, the extent to which that loss is distributed amongst powers is, of course, a uh, big variance. And I, I think India is one of those, and certainly the United States as well, that believe that in such circumstances, they would be benefiting more than maybe other countries. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Christian Connard speaking with us. We also joined by Satish K. Jha, who's an associate professor of political science at the Delhi University and a trade expert. Professor Jha, thank you for speaking with us. We're talking about, obviously, Trump's upcoming visit and the trade tensions. Now, here's the thing. This is a bad time for India to get into a trade spat with the U.S. There's an economic crunch. Unemployment is near a half-century high. The IMF has slashed India's growth forecast to 4.8% this year. And Modi's approach has been to go back to the protection playbook. Uh, is that going to fly? I mean, so you, you got the meeting of two leaders that seem to uh, both be uh, relying on old-style protectionism. In fact, as has, uh, I think that uh, India-US relationship as it has evolved in the last three decades, I think is based on some sort of pragmatic uh, you know, assessment on both sides. Uh, in fact, uh, whatever has come from Trump has not surprised anyone uh, in Delhi uh, because this election year. And then, uh, you know, on this trade issue, he's very sensitive and uh, he has been, you know, particularly raising this issue vis-a-vis -vis India also, uh, you know, from time to time. But one thing, uh, in fact, uh, should be also seen in this context that overall, the air of deglobalization is blowing all over. Uh, in fact, uh, and uh, India is no exception. As you also mentioned earlier, uh, that you know this protectionist, uh, you know, kind of uh, policies which are, are, you know, seen these days in India also, are largely on account of two factors. Uh, in fact, even the main opposition party, Congress, Indian National Congress, uh, which was basically the initiator of entire reforms in 90s, uh, you must have observed that on RCEP, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Pact, yeah. it was largely the pressure which came from the opposition. Uh, which forced uh, the Modi government to retrace its step. Uh, uh, and let finally, me, let me you know, uh, Professor Jha, let me introduce you. are making a very interesting point. As a matter of fact, I was going to come to this. But please explain how could, uh, you know, I mean, as, as, you, as you rightly said, the opposition did this and getting out of the regional comprehensive economic partnership, I mean, it's, a, it's the largest trade bloc in Asia. Why would the opposition pressure the Modi government in doing that? Uh, because, you know, uh, there are two, uh, you know, things to be kept in mind that already Indian economy at the moment is not uh, in a very good shape uh, yeah. as, you know, for last year, particularly after demonetization and GST, uh, it has taken a big shock and, you know, it's going down. Uh, so there are two, you know, uh, major, uh, you know, constituencies which are basically targeting Modi's policy. Uh, one is from his own party, uh, particularly the extended Shangha Parivar, as it is called, uh, this, uh, you know, Swadeshi Jagran Manch is a very important front within the, uh, you know, RSS uh, extended uh, family, uh, which has been uh, consistently raising the issue of, you know, trade liberalization and has been arguing for some protectionist uh, policies. So, in fact, Modi, I don't think, is in a position to ignore altogether uh, that pressure or that opinion within uh, its own fold. As well as the opposition has been targeting the government on a number of economic uh, policies, and therefore, in fact, at this moment, succumbing to you know any global pressure of opening up market or liberalizing trade uh, further uh, would be perhaps inviting more trouble on uh, the economic front. So far as uh, dealing with opposition and many other opinions in the country is concerned. So that is one thing. But so far, the Trump, uh, you know, Trump's statement is concerned. 
Number one, it has not surprised anyone because everyone uh, here at least is uh, clear that you know Trump is sensitive on this issue. Number two is election year for Trump. Uh, Modi has already come out of the election, but Trump is still has to face the American you know uh, you know voters uh, in November. So therefore, on this issue, he is not going to uh, buzz even an inch. That uh, every you know uh, you know analyst in Delhi. So so basically, so well. basically, the big trade deal unlikely to happen during this visit. I, I don't foresee any big uh, uh, trade deal uh, coming forth, but at the same time, there are many areas of convergence uh, between the two countries. No one can deny it. And I think Trump also knows it, because the kind of a statement which he made, that on the one hand, uh, India has never treated us well, perhaps he was only uh, meaning the economic, uh, the trade front. But on other issues, I think that, you know, people's to people's contact, the defense deal, uh, in the larger Asian Pacific, you know, security architecture, uh, perhaps which ties both of them. So therefore, there are many areas of convergence, and perhaps they will. Uh, I mean, both countries will go ahead on those issues and at least keep this trade issue, you know, in the uh, uh, you know in the background, and will not basically uh, push further uh, till November. So far, as the Trump is concerned, and I think that India will also reciprocate. It's interesting that you talk the Indo-Pacific strategy, Professor Jha, because uh, quite a few uh, former officials of uh, Bush and Obama administration have been saying that Trump's obsession with trade balance uh, is going to miss the big picture, which is the Indo-US uh, partnership, strategic partnership, especially in relation to the Indo-Pacific region, uh, in relation, as you know, uh, to China. So, but you're saying that while the trade issues will probably simmer still, uh, the rest of the issues uh, will move forward uh, as far as the strategic partnership is concerned. Have I uh, read that correctly? You are right, right, because, uh, you know, on issues of defense, uh, you know, uh, related uh, deals and, uh, you know, engagement, on issue of, uh, you know, the cultural and people's to people's contact, the track to diplomacy, and many other issues which have been going on for the last three decades. Uh, it's not basically uh, something which is, uh, you know, special for this Trump administration or this uh, Trump era. Uh, this has been going on for three decades. There's a bipartisan consensus in USA on these issues uh, between Democrats and Republicans. And I think in India also, uh, there are certain issues related to foreign policy where you find a lot of bipartisan consensus. So this will go on. But on trade-related issues, because of the larger global uh, situation, and also the domestic compulsions on economic front in both countries, USA as well as India, because Trump is a beneficiary of the protectionism so far as his popularity in the United States of America is concerned. And Modi also, uh, you know, trying to, you know, particularly increase that entire, uh, you know, rhetoric on, uh, you know, economic nationalism, uh, which will essentially uh, get translated into the, some sort of protectionism. Uh, that is also perhaps the requirement of the time. So two countries, uh, guided by their national interest and pragmatic assessment of the situation. I think that uh, will, uh, you know, play their own uh, ball and uh, perhaps only engage on other issues, uh, which perhaps uh, where we find a lot of convergence between the two, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China and larger, larger Asia-Pacific security architecture. Professor Jha, very quick uh, before I wrap up, uh, give me your sense of uh, you know, Modi has been riding the high tide of uh, India's soft image, which India created over the past three decades. But given various developments uh, internally, it seems to the observers that that strategic reserve might be eroding. Do you think that if the present situation continues in terms of the Hindutva outreach uh, within India, that that could be detrimental to India's uh, global image? In fact, uh, you know, uh, you know, there are two versions. Uh, in fact, a uh, lot of uh, scholar, a lot, lot of you know, analysts also, you know, believe that uh, the global opinion is not totally convinced that India has completely abandoned its uh, multicultural uh, path, democratic path, which is perhaps uh, the spirit of its constitution and its uh, polity. Uh, but of course, the recent uh, policy formulations have been criticized both here and globally. And therefore, uh, you know, one can say that it has taken some sort of beating uh, in recent uh, year, uh, recent months. Uh, but that does not mean that you know the entire uh, global 
uh, you know, community or the global community will see India only through the prism of few policies or the few, you know, recent developments. Okay. There are many other, there are many other areas, many other issues on which still India stands, uh, you know, firm and okay. uh, solidly. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Satish K. Jha, speaking with us. We'll take a short break and return to discuss the situation in Indian-occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Stay with us. Welcome back to Indus Special. Indian occupation troops have martyred three more civilians in Pulwama district. The civilians were targeted by during a cordon and search operation in the Tral area of the district. 26 unarmed Kashmiri civilians have been martyred by the Indian troops over the past two months. Meanwhile, scheduled local panchayat elections in the occupied valley have been cancelled after overwhelming rejection by the Kashmiris. Elections were set to be held on over 11,000 seats in the valley on March 5th. All major Indian political parties, including the Congress, National Conference and People's Democratic Party have already boycotted the polls. The party said there is no point of contesting the polls when all top Kashmiri leadership is under arrest by the BJP government. Meanwhile, authorities have registered a case against countless internet users employing proxy servers to avoid a social media ban in the occupied Kashmir. Police said they have misused social media to propagate a secessionist ideology. They added that the internet users could be charged under a law which allows the government to designate them as terrorists. The very has been under a communications blackout since August 2019, when India stripped the region of its autonomy. The tight internet restrictions in occupied Kashmir have been slammed by rights activists worldwide. To discuss the situation in the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir, we are joined by Ms. Hina Rabbani Kar, the former foreign minister of Pakistan. Ms. Kar, thank you for being with us. What's your reading of the situation? Look, um, I think my reading of the situation is that India has gone um, in a very consistent fashion, uh, continuing to lit literally challenge the very soul of Indian secularism and Indian constitution. Uh, and uh, challenging all the fruits that India was able to enjoy in, in the Committee of Nations as a democratic, uh, what they portrayed to be a secular force. And is basically now looking for a very, very different identity. So all the, uh, you know, the, the steps that you mentioned, which are Kashmir-specific, are all part quite uh, predictable in, in, in some ways because they are not very concerned about being challenged internationally. They're not being very concerned about being challenged uh, within the country because they believe that their vote bank is appeased and pleased by such actions. Okay, so uh, the UN Secretary General was here and he talked about Kashmir and uh, the way he spoke about Kashmir was something that really riled up the Indians. I mean, uh, you think that our diplomatic offensive is making headway now? It does. I think it's very interesting what is in the world, right, in particular region. region. Uh, if we were to take longevity and a long-term view, India is probably self-destructing like it has never done before. Because India, at every international forum, including very evidently at Munich also and everywhere else, is very clearly now taking jibes at multilateralism itself. Because of having done this in Kashmir, from being an aspirant to a Security Council permanent member, it is now taking jibes at the Security Council and at the UN. Whatever that may happen to multilateralism and the place of the UN, and we know, all know it's dwindling, However, it still remains an important part of your international order and, and the, perhaps the primary most important institution. So the Secretary General of the United Nations says nicely that my offices are available to uh, resolve what is this, you know, internationally recognized UNSC resolutions dispute between India and Pakistan. Thank you. That was uh, Hina Rabbani Khar, the former foreign minister of Pakistan. I'm also joined by Ravi Shrivastav. Mr. Shrivastav is an analyst, joins us from Mumbai. Mr. Shrivastav, uh, the Indian authorities uh, in uh, the uh, Indian occupied Kashmir have registered a case against countless internet users uh, who have employed proxy servers to avoid a social media ban. 
and the police have said that they've used social media to propagate secessionist ideology and they're saying that they will be charged under a law which allows the government to designate them as terrorists. Do you really think that this Kashmir policy by the Modi government is actually working? It's uh, unfortunate, undesirable, and situation is really precarious. First of all, they had an internet lockdown completely in Srinagar, in Kashmir area for nearly four or five months. You understand very well that today the entire life runs on internet, broadband, and telecommunication services only. Whether you want to withdraw money, whether you want to get your relatives or yourself treated in a hospital, the medicines, any such thing, everything is online. So, such, whether you want to uh, call a cab, uh, you know, as simple as just calling a cab. And uh, it, uh, it, it was criticized. It was criticized across the country. And uh, people have, uh, you know, questioned the uh, Modi government that what have you achieved? They have said that the, the, the government claims every day situation is normal in Kashmir. Anybody can go to Kashmir. There, is, there are no issues. The life is normal. Everything is normal. But when uh, the Debbie Abrams, the UK member of uh, parliament, the leader there, comes here and uh, she is returned back from the airport. She is deported because she wanted to go to Kashmir and she wanted to assess the situation. They tried some uh, sponsored tourism of Kashmir area by some European Union MPs, but even then they did not find any favorable report. So I think this is, and they, uh, the leaders they are like uh, Mahbubha Mufti, uh, Mr. Shri Shri Allah, Mr. Shri Mr. Shri I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm happy you talked about the deportation of the UK parliament member. Isn't this really bad for India's image, which India has crafted over three decades? As as it is, it is not an isolated incident. In fact, they are doing it on several fronts. They have slammed Turkey and Malaysia, who have been supporting uh, Pakistan, and they have uh, you know severed their ties with Malaysia in terms of imports and all those things. And another thing is that the worst part is they slammed even the UN. Secretary General, that why he was interfering in the, their internal matter of the Kashmir and all. Instead of talking, instead of resolving the issue, instead of uh, having a proper international image, the uh, today you are aware that uh, on uh, this uh, 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 Nagarikta Kanun, that Citizenship Act, the demonstrations are happening across the world. In the Sydney, in uh, UK, in uh, US, everywhere it is being opposed strongly. And India, perhaps you are aware that... Uh, all major cities have got uh, strong protests against this law and uh, uh, these Absolutely. things that Modi government is fighting is very difficult to contain it. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ravi Shrivasta, thank you so much for your insights. I'm also joined by Tony Ashai, who's an analyst, joining me from Dubai. Mr. Ashai, thank you. Uh, we were talking about what's happening in occupied and annex Kashmir. Uh, you know, uh, slapping charges on uh, internet users who are using proxies, uh, martyring three uh, youngsters only the other day in trial, uh, and generally, uh, you know, uh, a bad situation with the lockdown and everything. And yet, India seems to uh, trot out this argument that all is well uh, in Kashmir. Uh, is there some way of denting that narrative of India's? Well, um, thank you for having me on your show. Um, and uh, first of all, I have to say that if all was well in Kashmir, then why are there 700,000 Indian soldiers uh, stationed at every street corner? pointing guns at Kashmiri, 8 million Kashmiris. If all was well in Kashmir, why can't people use internet freely like they use everywhere else in the world? Why is government of India filing cases against Kashmiris who are using virtual networks? Uh, why is all this happening? Why are they turning away a British prime minister member of parliament from the airport because she wanted to go to Kashmir? Why is a U.S. congressman not allowed to go to, Cong uh, to Kashmir when he requested the Indian government? So, all is not well. And the problem is that India has a huge machinery of media and people working for it, and they're just peddling this narrative all over the world. And 
I think it's about time that Pakistan, which is the only country that supports Kashmiris openly, uh, morally, physically, whatever, should really set up something like that, a, a, a media company that would counter that narrative, which will expose these lies. And I think that's the only thing that will then. Thank you. That was uh, Mr. Tony Ashai speaking with us. This is all for tonight from Indus Special. We shall see you tomorrow at the same time. Meanwhile, for latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news. Good night and goodbye.